Over the next half hour, I'm going to talk through a story of when I worked at a cloud consultancy firm, how we bread teamed ourselves, how we hacked our own AWS environment, and, you know, to see what would happen, see what we'd learn along the way, to see whether people knew our security policies and procedures as well as we thought they did, to see who would step up given the, given the chance. So I'm going to kick off today with a wonderful Japanese word, surugiri, which is the closest embodiment of the spirit with which we undertook that fateful day. And for those who are unaware of the meaning, it means trying out a new samurai sword on a random passerby, which is a practice that Japanese samurai used to have. They used to test out new swords. And this, and this random passerby bit was kind of the interesting bit here because the red team that we had for the day knew what was going to happen. The blue team didn't know they were a blue team until until everything started. And we'll have a look at <laughs> exactly what happens when you do that as we go along. Now, a little bit about me. I'm Josh. I'm a distinguished technologist at Contino. I'm the author of the Cloud Native Security Cookbook with O'Reilly, uh, Hashi Ambassador, AWS Ambassador. I do lots of stuff in cloud and I write and run my mouth a lot. So kind of the overarching thing we were trying to do with this red teaming exercise was shift left learning. How do we, how do we make it so people are learning things ahead of time or as early as possible, make the learning cheap and, you know, how can we do better? You really don't want all your employees understanding what the instant response process while a real instant is going on, that's very much too late to be learning the ins and outs and to get that experience. When you look at this ubiquitous curve of time versus cost during an active security event, it's very expensive to have people learning. What you want is people that know what they're doing, who've been around before. Yeah, of course, you're going to have to do some exploration. There's always going to be new things, but a solid foundation of what the process is, what tools we have, making sure that our security approach is robust and rigorous and resilient and gives everyone what they need is really important. And for a consultancy, you shouldn't be telling clients to do what you're unwilling to do yourselves. You shouldn't be trying to tell them to adopt principles and approaches that you are unwilling to do yourself. So this was really an example for us to put our foot forward and try and see what happened. Now to kick off, I'm just going to go through a few mental models, some of which you may be aware of previously. This is a fairly classic one about different kinds of knowledge. Uh, you have known knowns, known unknowns, and unknowns unknowns. Now, no knowns are the things you know you know. You know you know these things, right? And these are just you know, some principles, like security is everyone's responsibility, right? We all know that. At least we did, we did this consultants. We all knew that it was all of our responsibilities, but, you know, <laughs> what does it actually look like when the rubber meets the road? You know, every company on earth pretty much has an instant response process that outlines what should happen in the in the instance of a breach or a potential breach. For us, you know, this this was pre-COVID as well, but for us being a consultancy firm, we're generally geographically dispersed across the city in which we operated. So for this, we actually brought everyone together. We didn't want to we didn't want to make it too challenging. <laughs> for everyone, right? And we wanted to bring people together so the, the bandwidth of communication was really high. So people could chat face-to-face. -face. We weren't doing this all over Slack. We weren't getting distracted while on client sites. We brought everyone together for this, everyone in the same room. We also thought we had a good idea of the expected avenues of when we started the red team event. We thought there were, th there were things we expected the blue team would do, things they would try, Naturally, uh, as being the masochists that we were, we decided to disable some of these by default. Uh, some of these things were making it so the most senior people who were going to be on the blue team side, their access was broken, right? Um, you know, we made sure we planned out our red team approach 
don't think it technically classifies as OSINT, but you know, you would expect that a real threat actor would pl- map out the environment and understand potentially the way that the, def- the blue team is going to respond to things. All right, into known unknowns, things we know we didn't know for this. Um, how do we measure performance in this? This isn't so much a measure performance for to measure against anyone else, but more just to give us a benchmark of when we do it again, have, have we got better? You know, have, have we as a team and as a company improved over time or have we stayed the same or have we got worse? So we picked some measures. Uh, feel free to uh, steal them if, if you try this kind of thing yourself. So first, time to identify. So from when the red team event started, how long was it until the breach was identified, recognized, and, you know, called that there was something weird going on in the environment. The second was the time to contain. So from once we're identified, how long was it until the blue team got control and managed to keep the, get, get the red team out of all systems? Yeah, very interesting one. Percentage of intrusion detected. So of all the things we managed to do as a red team, how many were found? And this was not during the event, but also including some cleanup time afterwards. Like how much stuff did people find of the things that we did? As the red team were able to leave things lying around in the cloud that people weren't aware of that could have been the site for a follow-up breach. Who will take responsibility? So this was, with this, the red team was made of myself and one of the guys, two of the more senior engineers in the company and the entire leadership team, the three directors at this company knew what we're doing. And what actually happened on the day was we all went somewhere else to do the, to do the red team event. So the blue team was left in the offices, but the leadership team and the two guys on the red team, we were, we were elsewhere. And this was a really interesting thing to see what would happen if we left the leadership vacuum, who would stand up and take control of the situation, who, who would take up the the mantle of leadership as it was on the day. Another thing, uh, this is a kind of a rule of thumb that I I subscribe to, is that processes generally break around 3x. Now, when I joined this company, it was about 10 people, and about the time this were about 30, we had a feeling that maybe our processes weren't fit for purpose anymore. And rather than try and come up with new processes just based out of our heads, we figured, how about we actually try some stuff and build the process around what we find, as opposed to, you know, base them on evidence rather than just what we think. And the last known unknown for me is a really interesting one. I always I think about a lot is in terms of what lenses do people possess. So when when you know people developers generally have a good development lens that they may not have a good operational lens or a good security lens. Like they look at problems a particular way. They build solutions of a particular style because of the nature of their experience and what they do. And I always find it's interesting when you can find the generalists or the T-shaped or M-shaped people or whatever letter we're using nowadays to talk through, well, can they look at stuff through a security lens? Can they understand it that way? Can they empathize with security? Can they look at things in that way? And this was a... An, an experiment on my behalf to find out, well, what security skills do we have in, in the business? Do we have people with that inclination? Do people have that ability to switch? Because we were made of mostly developers. We worked as DevOps teams, like you build, you run. That was our table stakes, what we did every day. So this was a really interesting point, point to find out, like, what people could we cultivate into security champions? Because they, they're just that way inclined and they have that ability to see the world the right way. Unless there's the unknowns unknowns. We knew going into this, we'd discover answers to questions we didn't even know we had. And, you know, you just find all these things. And, you know, when you think about unknowns, I mean, chaos engineering is the classic example that we do nowadays. You break things on purpose to realize what you find out from there. You don't necessarily know the question up front, but you decide to test things and see what happens. And this is very much a... Not, not the systems chaos engineering of Netflix fame, but more a chaos engineering of a company. Really, really interesting uh, day it was. Um, and naturally, uh, we were set some rules of engagement. There were some limits to what we were allowed to do. 
Uh, the CEO naturally put a financial limit on what we as the red team were able to do. We couldn't just go spin up some crypto mining. And bearing in mind, this was 2019, so crypto mining was quite valuable back then as well. Weren't allowed to do that. And a big thing was making sure that we didn't overly demoralize. We didn't make it too hard for the blue team to counteract, right? You don't, when you're doing these things, you win together or you lose together. There's no blue team one or red team one. It's about improving everyone together. Really kind of that holistic, like more wholesome approach to moving forward. All right. And with all that, we'll actually uh, shift on to the day itself. So we started at 10 a.m. because, you know, be kind to let people have their caffeine, let it kick in, make sure the coffees are, you know, nicely imbibed before you kick off and you start channeling a huge amount of stress into people. A really important thing we set out with this, and I kind of alluded to it before, where we disabled senior members' access to our cloud environments. This was an opportunity for us to channel learning through our more junior members of staff. So rather than have it so all the senior engineers all sit in a group of five and, you know, the 15 more junior people end up being kind of pushed to the side, we set it up so the only people with access to affect change on the environment were the more junior members of staff. So very much in like a pair programming style, the seniors had to channel their ideas and their expertise through the more junior people. So we're actually able to get this really nice passage of knowledge going through them. So everyone got to learn that it didn't end up in a, well, the, you know, the guys who are the most senior guys, they've got it, we'll just sit back. We really didn't want that to happen. We really want to feel the junior, more junior staff to feel involved, right? So at 10.03, uh, we uh, tripped the wire, so to speak. So being a serverless first consultancy, as they still are to this day, uh, we said that we booted up a virtual machine in our AWS environment because we had alerts that if anyone booted up a virtual machine, it would trigger alerts in Slack to say something weird is going on. We shouldn't be doing this. At the same time, we sent out a phishing email as well that we pre-crafted just to see what would happen, right? You know, give, give them a chance to figure out that something's going on. And... Six minutes later, six minutes later, someone someone did notice what was going on. Uh, someone called out that, hey, you know, something's looking a bit fishy. We could see it on Slack that they were messaging, like, is anyone trying to do something? Because this looks a bit weird. Um, and they started asking for some help. And a minute later, someone came to help them. Now, interestingly, both those people access, uh, we killed as soon as they started trying to do anything. And you might be wondering at this point how we know what's going on in the room. And we actually had the fly on the wall. So we actually had one person on the blue team side who was aware ahead of time that something was going to happen and was a communication conduit between ourselves and kind of what was going on in the room, right? I uh, kind of said before, we didn't want to overly stress people. We wanted to make sure this was something that's going to be remembered at least mostly fondly. And make sure that, you know, it that we weren't pushing too hard. And at the same time, we weren't making it too easy for them either. We want them to be stretched. We want them to try. We want it to be a challenge, right? Um, so two minutes after the second person came with a pair of hands, not a drill. It was called out on Slack that, okay, something's actually happening. Everyone needs to down tools and help. We need to mob around this problem and get there. Just exactly what we wanted to see, right? You want to see that... When something serious is going on, that people will down tools and get involved and pitch in to help. Five minutes after that, the CEO was called. Um, and I note this purely because call the CEO was number one in our instant response process. So from the initial time when something was noticed to actually get into step one was eight minutes. And I had the uh, lovely opportunity to see the CEO pick up his phone, look at it, put it back down on the table and go back to drinking his coffee without a worry in the world. <laughs> so this was something that we had thought about a little bit. We didn't really know how it was going to go. Was organically what structure was going to evolve out of the blue team with everyone in the office? What structure were they going to try and form to kind of combat what was going on? And the initial version looked like this. You had Paul, who was the first person to notice anything was going on. And he went, okay, I'm going to take ownership of the situation, and he had a whole bunch of people beneath him kind of reporting into him. 
naturally what happened there was this. Uh, there was too much going on, too much communication. He was trying to hold everything in his head. And bear in mind, it wasn't eight people talking to him. It was about 20. So when you've got that many people all trying to report into one person in a high-pressure environment with a lot of going on, I mean, we all know that's not going to work, right? That's not possible. So a little bit later on, they had to stop and regroup. I think uh, Paul Paul decided his head was on fire enough and went, okay, okay, let's let's actually stop and think about this and figure out what we're going to do. Uh, they went an access poll to figure out who still has access to AWS, who can still do things, so they could understand, you know, what parallelization they could actually action things and how they could channel and best set up to approach the problem. They also ended up adopting a communication and leadership role duality. So instead of just one leader with everyone reporting into him, there was Paul, the leader who was trying to, who took ownership for everything. And then Zainab, who was the second pair of hands to help out in that first place as well. She ended up stepping into this kind of communication facilitated filter role. So she would take all the information and pass it to Paul and filter it down for him to be able to make the decisions and calls that he needed to do. So that filtering of information actually allowed him to, you know, actually take more ownership and understand what was going on. Four minutes after that, they uh, realized that Pete, our fly on the wall, was not being very helpful and kind of just sitting there. And (laughs) once they uh, put him in a bit of interrogation, they realized that he knew what was going on and really wasn't there to help, and they kicked him out. (laughs) Which is, you know, more than fair enough. Seven minutes after that, uh, I actually managed to break out of AWS so I found one of our engineers' GitHub credentials sitting there in Parameter Store. So naturally, I start using those credentials and I create a lot of private repos with funny names under his GitHub account as well. And like this just came down to, for me, uh, an always interesting bit that one of the core components of AWS that people don't talk about enough, I feel like people talk about more than they used to, is KMS. Now, what it turned out at the end of it, at the end of the day, we went back and I had a chat to the engineer whose GitHub credentials I got. He thought he'd done the right thing by putting it in a parameter store. And he had encrypted it with KMS. He just hadn't set up the KMS key properly, so it was open to any principle within the account. So, you know, there's always these things of, you know, learnings. And uh, for me, KMS is one of the fundamental services within AWS or similarly in GCP or Azure that you have to get really, really comfortable and really, really good with because it is such a key part of actually being able to protect within an account or a subscription or a project, depending on your cloud of choice, right? Um, so at 10.50, which was 50 minutes after we started, all silent on the Western Front. Um, they realized that potentially seeing as this was something happening internally, maybe conversing on Slack, where we could also see it, in, as in we as in the red team, probably wasn't the best of ideas on their, on their behalf. <laughs> So instead, they moved to a Google group, if memory serves, and started chatting there instead so they could cut us out of the loop so we didn't know what was going on. So naturally, we we still wanted to have eyes and ears in the room so we could understand what was going on. So we sent them reinforcements, which were the COO and the CTO of the company. <laughs> they weren't going to be kicking them out of the room. And also, you know, they wanted to get in there and help Paul and Zainab out who'd been taking on the majority of the workload and the stress and just try and you know, take some of the stress off and just make sure that, again, we weren't pushing people too hard. Um, 10.57, the false contain. Uh, They thought, the blue team thought they got us. They asked, uh, the C2 and CO asked, you know, do you have it under control? Like, yeah, we think we've got them out in the systems. No, they had not. Um, It's about 18 minutes after that, we got more brazen in what we were doing, kind of putting stuff right in their faces where we knew they were looking just to realize, no, no, we were still in. We still had accounts that we're accessing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Five minutes after that, we did send them a photo on Slack of us, of our faces, which, as you would imagine, caught quite a bit of uh, written abuse, all in good taste and all in good fun. And eight minutes after that, they did actually uh, manage to contain us. So it was about an hour and a half to get the full contain and we lost access to everything. Um, a little bit after that, we took a sweet time. We were just next door in a coffee shop. Uh, we took a sweet time going back to the office and we walked in and proceeded to be, um, there were hand gestures made at us as we walked back in the door, which 
quite quite a thrill being uh, having that done to by twenty five people all at once. But you know, we we came back because it was time to move from containment to remediation. So now they had locked us out, and we wanted to actually help with the cleanup. Right, we'd done things in lots of places. We want to help. Wanted to help the blue team find what we'd done to a large degree and make sure that they were cleaning th- cleaning things up and not necessarily telling them where everything was, but giving them leads and clues and all that kind of stuff so they could figure out. So, uh, Kaizen, change for good, continuous improvement. All that, all that good stuff from Lean. Lean Theory, and this was kind of what, what the second half of the day was based around, is how do we understand and reflect on the experience of, w- of what that morning was, realize where our problems were, where our gaps were, where we did really well, where we didn't do so well, the opportunities for improvement, all that kind of stuff. So scores on the doors, um, time to identify was 12 minutes from them to go from us starting to do things to actually calling that an incident was happening. A few minutes earlier, they did kind of get a sniff of it and realize something was going on, but it was 12 minutes. Time to contain was an hour and 28 minutes. So an hour and a half to get us from in to locked out of all systems. Percentage of intrusion detected. So they caught about two thirds and we, we ran up a tally. We were, as the red team, we were making notes of every single thing we did in the private Slack channel, just to make sure that when we stepped back through, we could find everything. One of the interesting things, one of the interesting questions we got as we were going through this process was, oh, but that wasn't a realistic scenario, which was an interesting question to get when we'd spent a lot of time thinking about it, making sure that we tried to make it as realistic as possible. The initial breach was one person's set of credentials uh, and it just kind of went from there. You know, I, I think a lot of the time, sometimes, I think maybe it's getting a little bit better people realize that uh, security problems and breaches are a matter of when, not if. But just making it so people, it, it, fe- it felt real for people for a little bit, which I think was important that it did. And then, you know, we could talk about, no, this was a perfect realistic, this could well happen to us, right? I mean, always going to backups never fail, restores do, like having these processes and everything else. If if you've got this security process and approach and everything else that you, you know, you think is valuable, test it. If you're not testing it with realistic scenarios, then you don't have a process at all, right? The same as if you take backups, but you never restore them, you don't really have backups, do you? Um, this was something that I'd been reading about at the time we did this. And I just thought it was, it helped me reason about why as the red team, we felt we were one step ahead continually to the blue team. Like, yeah, they did catch an hour and a half, but to a fair degree, we let them catch us. Again, we didn't want to make it too hard. We didn't want to spend all day with them chasing us, right? There are, there are diminishing returns to these things. A new loop comes from seven seven second John Boyd, who was a fighter pilot and trainee and, and trainer, and effectively had this loop that he used to describe how he was able to beat people in dogfights, and he was nigh unbeatable, right? And the idea is this loop you go through: observe, orient, decide, and act. The OODA loop: first you observe, then you orient, then you decide, and then you act. And what we found. And, and the idea with this loop is the faster you go through the loop, the more you can outmaneuver and outperform the person you're against. And with our observability, especially on a blue team perspective, we just what we found was the blue team just didn't have a good idea of what was going on. They couldn't see what was going on. They couldn't find what was going on. Everything was very manual for them to find things. And there was just a lack of tooling that, that we had, we didn't have, they didn't have the right tools to be able to fight back. Because as the red team, we kind of knew where they were and we were running out ahead and we were, you know, we were dictating the pace of everything and we could create things faster than they could find things. And at that point, it's just, you know, it's an exponential curve where you outrun. So this was a definite thing. And what, what the, <laughs> what was the painful bit was that this lack of tooling, um, we had tooling on random people's laptops from client engagements for, you know, visibility pieces and other bits and pieces that we need. 
but just never been put back into common repositories. It wasn't shared. It was talked about after the fact that, oh, well, I've got something that does that. Well, why not? You know, all those kind of things. Again, it's one of those things that sometimes you need this catalyst. This catalyst gives you a bias to action and to find where these holes are. Uh, one of the things that we definitely did do was every idea, every gap, everything that we came up with through this process, we captured them. And naturally, they became Jira tickets in a backlog because how else do you capture your best intentions and best wishes? Um, but, you know, our bench capacity going forward, um, it was like a rite of passage to pick stuff off this backlog and work against it because the story became... A myth, a legend, I haven't worked at this company in three years, yet if I walk in the door, people who I've never met before, new employees, know who I am and know what I did on that day. <laughs> it's an um, interesting uh, legacy to have. Um, and yeah, it became the beginning of a tradition from there. From there, we ran a internal CTF. We ran public CTFs. Uh, we did more of these security game days, workshops, red team events. It became, you know, something of a con yeah, tradition that is really still really strongly cherished at that company. It was something that really brought security up to a first-class citizen, up to, you know, part, a, a thread in the weave of the, of the culture of the company that it's just never going to go away now. And I'll just leave you with a, a final thought, which is... Why red team? Why do this? And I'm going to just dip into a very quick chess analogy, which is the difference between a novice and a master. Novice chess players look at the board in pieces. They see every piece individually, and they have to hold all that in their head. The master looks at the board and sees patterns, things they've seen before. That's how they're able to move and understand how to go and be as good as they are and, you know, be a thousand to a hundred thousand times better than a novice, right? Like a master chess player can play a novice a thousand times and not lose. And really when it comes down to it, if I was in the trenches with someone during a real security incident, would I rather have a novice next to me or a master? The choice is yours. <laughs>